this week. New York City has witnessed the rise and fall of countless criminal empires, from ruthless contract killers to some of history's most notorious kingpins. Journey across decades for a look at the dark side of the American dream. Right now, Fox 5's crime in the city, the mob. Here are some of the crimes that gripped the five boroughs. We begin in Manhattan, 1979, and the search for a grisly graveyard hidden beneath the streets of Hell's Kitchen. A lot of cops are out digging tonight, not for clues, they're after bodies. The Daily News claims the police might find as many as 60 bodies, people killed by the mob and buried on the west side of Manhattan. Now, the police say that number is way too high. Nevertheless, it's a very interesting story. 10th Avenue in the 40s, an area long known as Hell's Kitchen. Turf claimed by countless ethnic thugs and often fought over. A doorway on West 50th Street leads one down three flights of stairs to track level. It is here that the police are searching for bodies or perhaps parts of bodies. A front end loader was trucked in from the police range in the Bronx this morning. It took a half hour for it to rumble up the tracks from 36th Street to the abandoned and debris littered tunnel at 50th. This is one of several spots along a 14 block stretch of track that detectives feel may house bodies. They think the bodies may possibly not even be buried, but simply covered over by trash. So, detectives sift through each bucket full of litter that is scraped together by the front end loader, looking for skeletal remains of murder victims who may have been dead for as long as five years. A special group of cops, the Organized Crime Homicide Task Force, has been working on the investigation for almost two months. This crew over here on the west side that have been operating for several years, uh, going back at least to the 1930s, was known as the old arsenal mob. And as far as I'm concerned, that's what it is. This is the lower or the current day arsenal mob. And uh, any particular ethnic persuasion to this mob? Uh, most of the people involved would be Irish. And who do you think uh, is down here? What kind of victims? Uh, I can't tell you what they were involved in, but uh, it's not one particular incident. Different types of uh, reasons for killings. That's correct. Sergeant Coffey says that they are looking for two bodies, victims of murders in 1976 and 1977, that they have reason to believe may be buried here. There also may be more. They don't know how many more. They do know that the nine men assigned to this task will be down here digging until about the end of the week. And the entire area from 38th Street to 52nd Street along these tracks will be sealed off as a crime search scene. In the summer of the same year, investigators begin to close in on a shadowy hitman with countless bodies in his wake. For the past two years, federal authorities have been looking for the man behind dozens of murders of government witnesses and mob figures. In every single case, the killer has used a 22 caliber pistol. Now, says the FBI, all of the killings can be connected to a small group of hitmen, but the bulk of those rubouts can be tied to one man. John Miller has this exclusive report. His name is Tommy. Tommy P, we'll call him. He is 48 years old. We cannot reveal his last name because, at this point, he has never been charged with a crime. Tommy P. is a partner in a New Jersey-based construction firm. He is well-built, and FBI surveillance reports indicate he exercises and jogs four hours a day. He is reportedly a millionaire and probably the top professional killer in the United States today. Tommy lived in Little Ferry, New Jersey. However, he recently relocated to upstate New York, and today his whereabouts exactly are unknown. Here's a little background. He is a prime suspect in the murder of Arthur Milgram. Milgram had a monopoly on the New York State lottery vending machines until he was executed, getting into his car on February 10, 1977. He has been connected by informants to the murder of Frank Chin, a wiretap expert who was shot in the face six times at close range as he was getting into his car. Like Milgram, Chin was hit with a 22. In the past 18 months, 49 people, including known mob figures, government witnesses, and underworld informants, have been wiped out by hitmen using 22 caliber pistols. The names keep coming. Tony Palermo, a known hood. Jimmy Queeley, the Newark High School principal who was murdered on the front lawn of his New Jersey home. 15 murders matched to the same 22 caliber gun, and 34 other killings across the nation, all with 22s. There is no telling how many of that string of killings might be connected to Tommy P., the hitman, 
But one federal authority described the murders as a direct challenge from the mob to the U.S. government. And so far, it seems the mob is winning. Though the FBI informants pegged Tommy P. as the hitman, none will testify because they fear for their own lives. So, federal prosecutors have begun an investigation into the fortune Tommy P. has amassed through an endless string of murders, hoping to make a tax evasion case. But until fear in the underworld subsides, Tommy P., America's most feared hitman, is still free and up for hire. Now to the early days of 1985 and the efforts of then U.S. Attorney Rudy Giuliani to bring down the city's top bosses. You buy some candy or cigarettes in a vending machine, you eat at certain restaurants, or you go to see some sexy movies, and some of the money you're spending could be winding up in the mob's pockets. U.S. Attorney Ralph Giuliani says flatly, things cost a lot more in New York, and things are more unpleasant here because of what the mafia does. Today, federal officials tried to start making the mob bosses do the paying. For the first time ever, the reputed heads of all five crime families in our town were hauled into court on one indictment. Rob O'Brien found Giuliani and the other top law officials smiling. Great day for law enforcement, but this is a bad day, probably the worst, for the mafia. This case charges more mafia bosses in one indictment than any ever before. Paul Big Paul Castellano. According to Lawman, he's boss of the 800 gangsters who are said to make up the Gambino crime family. Castellano and the four other men fingered by the feds as godfathers of New York's five crime families, all indicted today. Castellano left the federal courthouse in Lower Manhattan tonight after posting $2 million bail money. The five mob bosses are accused of running the commission, said to be the ruling body of the most powerful organized crime elements in the entire nation. FBI Director William Webster says the commission dominates the many families that make up La Cosa Nostra or LCN. We now know this much about the commission, that it's a governing body separate and distinct from the individual LCN families, that illegal activities that cross family lines must have the commission's approval, and that extends to their own in-house discipline, including hits and murders. One of the murders the commission supposedly okayed was the 1979 rubout of Carmine Galenti said to have been boss of the Bonanno family. But Castellano's attorney, James LaRossa, says the feds will have to prove the commission's existence. I believe there's crime, and I believe that people bind together in it. Therefore, you can call out an organized crime. I don't believe there's a commission. I don't believe there's a La Casa Nostra, and it has to be proven to me, and it has to be proven to an American jury at one point. The other alleged mafia bosses indicted today are Antonio Tony Ducks Corallo, said to be head of the Lucchese crime family. Philip Rusty Rastelli, reputed head of the Bonanno crime family. Gennaro Jerry Lang Langella, identified by the indictment as acting boss of the Colombo family. And Anthony Fat Tony Salerno, the 74-year-old reputed Don of the Genovese mafia family. Salerno, too, made his bail of $2 million this evening. Proceeded out of the courthouse by some younger protectors, Salerno faces possible sentences of up to 200 years in prison time if convicted. His attorney, Michael Rosen, calls the federal indictment something out of Alice in Wonderland. This is a circus put on and orchestrated by the uh, powers that be over there at St. Andrews Plaza. Meaning the federal prosecutor? That's what it means. You say there's nothing to the federal government con uh, contention that... We, we will address the charges in court we were supposed to address them. We're not going to address them out on the street, and we're not going to address them in the press. During today's bail hearing, federal prosecutors said thousands of hours of taped conversations had been recorded by the 90 wiretaps and 80 bugging devices used during the long investigation. U.S. Attorney Giuliani says the bugs, one of which was hidden by federal agents in the dashboard of Antonio Corallo's chauffeur-driven Jaguar, provide a vivid picture of how the American mob functions. Also in court today, Christopher Christy Tick Fernari, accused consigliere of the Lucchese family and reputed Lucchese underboss Salvatore Tom Mick Santoro. Santoro's attorney Sam Dawson, pleading for low bail, told the court Santoro is suffering from cancer of the colon and should be in the hospital. Instead, both Santoro and Fernari are being held in lieu of $1,750,000 bail each. My client was riding around in that car, and there wasn't one word that came out of his mouth that indicated any activity on his part of a criminal nature. A lot of good radio music, a lot of great radio music, and WINS uh, News was played all the time, and one of the music stations was played all the time. Maybe that's not, why... Not all that much about criminal conduct, I'll tell you that. 
U.S. Attorney Giuliani's description of the bail amount set here today, very solid, very reasonable. Giuliani says it may be as long as a year before this case goes to a jury. And in November of 1986, Fox 5 gave viewers a closer look at the ever-changing faces and places of New York's five families. Another hit that made big headlines occurred outside the Sparks Steakhouse 11 months ago. Paul Castellano was a target then, and his murder changed the face of organized crime's most powerful family, the Gambinos. Tonight, in part two of his special report on where the mob lives, former New York City police detective Frank Grimes takes a close-up look at the man they call the Dapper Don. This is how many people in the mafia retire. Last December, some in the Gambino crime family thought the boss, Paul Castellano, had been in power long enough. He and his number two man, Tommy Bellotti, were retired in front of a Manhattan restaurant. But this is also how many people in the Mafia get promoted. With Castellano and Bellotti out of the way, alleged Gambino family capo John Gotti seized power. Law enforcement officials say he's the man who now heads the Mafia's largest and most powerful crime family. Gotti carries that prestige with a flair that has attracted a lot of publicity. He seems to enjoy it. He strides past reporters and cameras, his head held high, his body wrapped in expensive suits. One report said each suit cost $1,000. Gotti supposedly got angry. The suits cost $1,800. John Gotti, a man with the label mob boss, lives with his wife and children in this house in a middle-class neighborhood in Howard Beach, Queens. Private security patrols routinely canvass the quiet streets. No one was at home at the Gotti house on this rainy day, so I talked to neighbors. I asked how they felt about living near the man who law enforcement officials say killed people to get to the top. I'm not afraid. In fact, I feel safer. You feel safer? I sure do. <laughs> Why is that? My cars have been stolen in every area but this one. <laughs> Others on Gotti's blog said the only time they see him is on TV or in the newspapers. They had no comment beyond that. But Gotti's next door neighbor had this to say. I'll tell you something, they're the most beautiful people you can meet. This is where Gotti hangs out the Bergen Hunt and Fish Club on 101st Street in Ozone Park. Law enforcement officials say it's Gotti's headquarters, a place for meetings, deals. The FBI bugged it, so it's quiet here now. The folks oh in this neighborhood God, don't see much of John Gotti these days, but I they know. remember. That's the best man around, and I'm 45 years old, the best man for me. I've known him as a youngster and always as a gentleman. Whenever I see him walking, he always has a marvelous smile on his face. In fact, I admire the way he dresses. But John Gotti's suits aren't getting much wear right now. He's in jail, on trial in Brooklyn Federal Court for racketeering. Some in the family may look for him to retire. Although Lieutenant Remo Franceschini of the New York City Police Department says when mob bosses are in jail, their position sometimes gets stronger, as long as they don't stay in jail for too long. Because they have many hours to think about their structure and about who's loyal and who's disloyal. And they have a constant communication going in and out of there you know, to let them know who is loyal to them and who's not. According to law enforcement officials, there are three men who stand out as Gotti loyalists. Sal Gravano, Joseph Butch Correo, and Joseph Armon. Officials say Armon has a long history with the Gambino family and an extensive arrest record to prove it. He lives here in this row of houses on 92nd Street in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. I went there to try to speak with Armon. He wasn't in. But his wife told me the only business Joe is in is the fruit business. In a fruit business. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. You can take <laughs> it from me because I'm his wife. All these organized crime people have uh, some sort of a basis uh, for, uh, for employment. They, they use, uh, in, in many cases, uh, you know, cover employment. Uh, but the fact of the matter is their, their employment is, uh, is illegal activity, criminal activity. If federal prosecutors can convince a Brooklyn jury that that is true of John Gotti, he may go to jail long enough where he loses his power slowly, instead of all at once on a sidewalk. Next, we head to Queens, and yet another act of brazen mob brutality carried out in plain sight. We're any customers in a Queens barbershop this morning, so the owner turned on the television set and settled back in a chair. And since there were no customers to watch, when three men came in, they could take their time, and they did. They pumped at least 10 shots into the barber. Dave Browdy reports. I want to know who killed him. Who me? He's my nephew. I know, know it. You. I know it. Family members and neighbors say a car with three men inside had been waiting for some time this morning outside the father and son's hair cutters in Ozone Park. 
waiting apparently for Vito Scaglione, the owner, to open for business. No sooner had he done so than the three men donned ski masks, and police say they started shooting. There was some uh, talk, I don't know how, it's not been confirmed yet, that the, he might have had a fairly violent argument a while ago with some other individual from the neighborhood. That's another aspect we're looking. That's why I don't want to characterize it as a mob hit. We know so little bit about it. Police say the dead man had no known connections to organized crime. Relatives and neighbors indicated they knew of nothing unusual at the shop. Scaglione had owned it for 15 years and worked there actively as a hair cutter. Pence last night, I waved to him, said hello, you know, how you doing? Well, just a wave every time I walk by, you know, when I walk past. He used to cut my hair when I was a kid, when I was going yeah, to school. Yeah, everybody went here to get their hair cut. Well, oh, I know, he's a wonderful man, you know. I just can't believe it. I'm, I'm shocked. There have been three killings connected by detectives to mob frictions in recent weeks, but since police have found no known mafia connections involving Vito Scaglione, and since today's killing bears no professional hallmarks, with the killers actually sitting in a car waiting outside the shop for Scaglione to show up, investigators say it seems unlikely that this was a high-level hit. Since detectives already know with whom the owner of the shop had the dispute, and because this is the kind of neighborhood where everyone knows everybody, and there are a lot of people on the streets, Police are confident they'll make progress on this case quickly. And finally, we complete our journey on Thanksgiving Day in 1991 and the beginning of the end for the Teflon Don himself, John Gotti. There is one family not having a happy Thanksgiving, the Gambino crime family, with reputed boss John Gotti eating federal turkey in a lower Manhattan prison. The former aide he most trusted is reportedly singing like a canary. The New York Post reports Sammy the Bull Gravano, who stunned the underworld by cooperating with the feds, will link Gotti's crew to 15 to 20 mob rubouts. Presumably among them, the brazen assassination of former godfather Paul Castellano, the murder Gotti is accused of engineering to ascend to the mafia throne. You're dealing with a man who's alleged to be a killer. And jurors find that hard to stomach. Larry Bronson is a lawyer who has many clients alleged to be organized crime figures. He says just because Gravano may talk does not mean a jury will believe him. Mr. Gravano is alleged to have committed a murder uh, in the in original indictment and testifies that he committed it. The jury may well feel that this is not the kind of agreement that the government should engage in and that Mr. Gotti should not be responsible for a murder committed at somebody else's hands. Sources say Gravano could help solve mob hits, like the World Trade Center murder of Gambino member Louis de Bono. De Bono was killed for not reportedly responding to a Gotti order, or the rub out of Edward Lino, a former Gotti associate who was cleared in a drug trial that convicted Gotti's brother Gene. Another New York crime family, the Columbos, is reportedly also being rocked by a major defection. The Sunday night killing of reputed mob loan shark Henry Sumra in Sheepshead Bay, Brooklyn, could stem from the reported turning of alleged Colombo capo Gregory Scarpa, who is said to be informing on a dozen more murders. Besides Gotti, the whole mob may not have much to be thankful for in this Thanksgiving. According to the Fortune list of 50 biggest mobsters from five years ago, only eight are still in business. 23 are in jail, and as for the rest, well, they are either out on bail, retired, or dead. And that's this week's Crime in the City. Subscribe for more at youtube.com slash fox5ny.